Our next goal in understanding martingales and sub-martingales is to prove some nice maximal inequalities about the size of the maximum that they take over the first n steps compared to their value at the end time. In order to state and prove one of those important inequalities, we need to, in this short lecture, first backtrack to one more topic from pure measure theory that we skipped over, and that is Hilder's inequality. It's a key result, but we haven't needed it until now. Hilder's inequality is an inequality between different LP norms. Given some exponent p, and let's say strictly between 1 and infinity, its conjugate exponent p prime is defined by the relation 1 over p plus 1 over p prime equals 1. In other words, p prime is just the constant p over p minus 1. Now, we could also make sense of what p prime should mean if p is equal to 1. From this formula here, if p is equal to 1, 1 over p prime should be 0, so p prime should be infinity. And similarly, if p is equal to infinity, then p prime should equal 1. So by convention, we'll define p prime that way in the case where p is 1 or infinity. Notice with these conventions that for all p between 1 and infinity inclusive, the conjugate exponent of the conjugate exponent is the original p. Helder's inequality, which holds in an arbitrary measure space, says the following. If p is any exponent between 1 and infinity inclusive, if f and g are any two measurable functions over some measure space, then their product measured in L1 norm is bounded above by the product of the LP norm of f and the LP prime norm of g, where p and p prime are conjugate to each other. Now, just to be clear here, it doesn't matter if any of these are in L1 or LP. F and G are measurable, which means that the absolute value of them is a measurable non-negative function, and so its integral here makes perfect sense, although it could take infinite value. Similarly, the right-hand side could be infinite, but at least it's well-defined. In the special case where we know a prior I that F G is in L1, then we could compare this with the slightly sharper inequality that the absolute value of the integral of F G is less than or equal to that which makes sense now and is true at this stage simply by the triangle inequality. And let me note that if we take the special case where p is 2, and when p is 2, p prime from this relationship is also 2, then that statement here is exactly the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. So Helder's inequality can be thought of as an LP generalization of the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality. On the other hand, if p is equal to 1, or if p prime is equal to 1, in order to even make sense of what this says, we need to know what L infinity is. Well, the L infinity norm is just the essential supremum of the absolute value of the function. That is, it's the smallest number, alpha, such that the measure of the set where the absolute value of f is bigger than alpha is 0. That means that if this number is finite, then f is essentially bounded. With full measure, it's less than or equal to some constant, and this is the smallest such constant that it is almost everywhere less than or equal to. Now in that case, Helder's inequality is again quite straightforward to prove, because if we take p equal to 1, meaning that in Helder's inequality we're supposed to take p prime equal to infinity, we can just note that g is less than or equal to its essential supremum almost surely, which means that inside the integral, we get this is less than or equal to f times the essential supremum of g. But the essential supremum of g is a constant, and so we can bring it outside the integral. And so that exactly gives us that essential supremum, which is the L infinity norm, times the integral of the absolute value of f, which is the L1 norm of f. So Hilder's inequality is an interpolation between this simple result for bounded functions and the Cauchy-Schwarz inequality in the middle. The proof will require a very elementary convexity result from one variable calculus, if you like, and that is the following. If s and t are any two non-negative numbers and p is an exponent between 1 and infinity exclusive, then the product s times t is less than or equal to 1 over p times s to the p plus 1 over p prime times t to the p prime. In the special case, 
P is equal to 2, taking square roots of both sides gives us what's known as the arithmetic geometric mean inequality. The proof is just done by noting that the exponential function is convex. And so that means, given that 1 over P and 1 over P prime are two numbers in the unit interval that add up to 1, that if I take s times t, well, s is e to the log of s, t is e to the log of t, but by the properties of exponentials, that's the exponential of log s plus log t. Now, again, by the properties of exponentials, log s is the same as 1 over p times the log of s to the p. And log of t is equal to 1 over p prime times the log of t to the p prime. And therefore, by the convexity of the exponential function here, that's less than or equal to 1 over p times e to the log of s to the p plus 1 over p prime times e to the log of t to the p prime. But e to the log of s to the p is s to the p, e to the log of t to the p prime is t to the p prime, and so this is equal to that, which concludes the proof of this simple inequality. But actually, Hilder's inequality is really just that simple inequality applied to normalized functions f and g in place of s and t. That is to say, Hilder's inequality, which says this in general, well, let's note a few things. First of all, we've already shown why the case p equals 1 or infinity are straightforward from the definition of the L infinity norm. Moreover, if either of the two terms on the right-hand side are zero, that means that either f or g is almost surely zero, which means that f times g is almost surely zero, and therefore this L1 norm will also be zero, so we get agreement there. We can also safely assume that f and g are in the respective LP spaces that they need to be in. After all, if the right-hand side here is infinite, then there's no content to this equation because this is less than or equal to infinity automatically. So for the rest of the proof, we will assume that p is strictly between 1 and infinity and that the LP norm of f is finite and strictly positive and the LP prime norm of g is finite and strictly positive. That being the case, we can define the following two renormalized functions. S is the function absolute value of f divided by the LP norm of f. T is the absolute value of g divided by the LP prime norm of g. And therefore, S times T is just this function here, absolute value of f times g divided by the product of these norms. Now, applying this convexity inequality that we just proved, that's less than or equal to this convex combination of S to the p and T to the p prime. But if we take what those are and take their powers appropriately, that says the following, that this is less than or equal to 1 over p times the pth power of the absolute value of f divided by its LP norm to the pth power plus 1 over p prime times the p prime power of the absolute value of g divided by the p prime power of its LP prime norm. And now all we need to do is take integrals of both sides using the monotonicity of the integral with respect to any measure. On the left-hand side over here, what we get is the absolute value of fg divided by that product of norms. And on the right-hand side, this is equal to 1 over p times the integral of f to the p divided by the p norm to the pth power of f plus 1 over p prime times the integral of g to the p prime divided by the p prime norm to the p prime power of g. But of course, this is the definition of that quantity there. And this is the definition of that quantity there. And so this is 1 over p times 1 plus 1 over p prime times 1, which is 1. And so that shows that this quantity here is less than or equal to 1, which is, in this case, that we've reduced to equivalence to Holder's inequality, concluding the proof.